Support for the Dice Tower comes from listeners like you, and from The Op, also known as USAopoly, and from GameNerds.com. Thanks for your support. The Dice Tower, Episode 706. The best of 20 years ago, 2001. Welcome to the Dice Tower, a podcast about board games and card games, and especially the people who play them. On today's show, we have a tale of board gaming horror. We answer questions from the mailbag about, among other things, what you would do if you found a super rare game at a tag sale, and we head back a full 20 years to see how much our top 10 games from 2001 has changed. I'm Eric Summerer, and joining me now, the Dave to my Hal, Tom Vassell. Bum, bum, bum. Bum, bum. Bum, 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 I've been practicing my computer voice because I'm prepping for a, uh, a lit RPG novel. Uh, and so I have to stay, say stuff like, Your Burninate skill is now level 5, plus 4 dexterity. Okay, I just found out, and, well, let, hang on one second. Folks, I'm Tom Vassell. Oh, hi, I'm Eric Summerer. We're here to talk about board games, but I want to talk about this thing Eric just mentioned. Well, okay. Until like a year ago, I didn't know this was a category of writing. Yeah. It's, like this, it's called lit RPG. Or game lit. Yeah. Uh, it's essentially what it is, is the the books are written and people are leveling up in the books. Yeah. And sometimes they're they're kind of subtle about it. Although I think that's like one in 10 that I read that was even slightly subtle. Most of them are, they knock you over the head with it. There, there might be some, no, some gentle knocking, perhaps. Usually it's some sort of, um, you know, alternate universe where people are entering a virtual reality world, um, maybe to escape the post-apocalyptic wasteland they live in. Uh, and so their, their world is governed by game rules and you get a lot of system messages. Yeah, I, I, uh, when I read one of these books, I thought, that's a clever idea. And then it recommended another one, and I thought, huh, the plot of this feels almost the same. And then the more I read, the more I thought, huh, I didn't realize there was this many books, and I am not of the opinion that most of these books are well-written. Hmm. Um, the Two of the ones I read, the people started leveling up in real life. Okay. But then also monsters attacked them. But then people around them, sometimes they noticed, sometimes they didn't. And I thought that could make for a clever idea, but I don't know. These always, I, I, they, they feel like they're written for young adults, but I like young adult literature and I don't think it has to be written stupidly. Okay. Uh, I read a couple I enjoyed, but after a while I kind of got, you know, leveling up is kind of a grindy thing when you do it in a board, in a video game. <laughs> yeah. I don't know why I want to read about it. I mean, because some of the books I read, that was like the whole focal point. It's like, you're now level 64. Your strength went up by one and this. And I'm thinking, wait, I'm reading this. I'm reading someone else's RPG. <laughs> um, it, it is. It's, it's a genre. The one I'm reading right now is a guy who plays a dragon character, except he soon discovers that the dragon takes over his body when he enters the game. And so now you've got a dragon NPC running around as a human while the guy plays, the human plays the dragon in the game. That's interesting. It creates some some foibles. The weirdest one I read was the main character was the dungeon. Okay. They were a dungeon, and the dungeon would grow, and people were coming to the dungeon, and they were trying to kill some people. You can be the cave. It was... I, I After, like, four or five chapters, I was like, I can't keep reading this. It just... It wasn't gripping me. I, again, it's just it felt like I was reading fan fiction. Again, uh, for those out there, there might be I may be just missing this. There may be great examples of the genre, and the free examples I was reading on Amazon Unlimited <laughs> may not be the best ones. I don't know. I always jump from book to book. They're usually you know part of a long series, but if the first book doesn't grab me, I'm I'm out. Yeah. Okay. Tom Tom at Dicetower dot com because I know some of you are going to send me good examples at this point. It's, it's entirely possible. I do like leveling up, and when games let you level up, that's pretty fun, and I'll talk a little bit about that later. Um, 
So folks, if you're listening to our show, we're here to talk about board games, but we also have other things. If you want to get our newsletter that tells you everything going on on both the audio show and our video channel, just go to DicetowerDigest.com. You can find out news on our podcast, Dice Tower Now. And if you wanted to back our Kickstarter but missed it, our pledge manager at GameFound is open, and you can simply go there by going to DicetowerKickstarter.com if you want to jump in before we close that. I was just remarking to Eric before we started recording today. I said, do you know there's a lot of games out these days? I hadn't noticed. Well, here's the thing that I'm enjoying about this is normally games come in these overwhelming waves. There's the Gen Con wave, the Christmas wave, the Essen wave, you know. And there's always a doldrum period from February to like early May Hmm. where I've played all the good games. (laughs) And you go through the bucket, buckets of trash. Hmm. Okay. But... But I'm not having that happen anymore for two reasons. One, COVID has knocked out conventions, so publishers are just releasing games when they're done. Right. But more importantly, the, the Kickstarters are coming in full swing now, and they just they send you the game when it's ready. Right. They're not waiting for a convention. They <laughs> they already had enough pro- problems, and they're probably six months late. You know, they don't want to. <laughs> they're not yeah. like, well, we're six months late, but we should wait four more months for a convention. Nah, send it to people. And yeah, some of these games are living up to their potential and some are not. So I have a bunch of games I'm going to talk about today. They're all geared towards kids or sort of yeah. in many ways. So let's go through your games first, Eric. We'll do the uh, adult games. Ah, even, well. though, even though your first game sounds like a kid's game. I know it's not, but it sounds like a kid's game. Uh, the first game is from a design studio called Sashi and Sashi. They're a Japanese uh, company that, that always has lovely, quirky, uh, charming titles. And one of their big hits of the last couple years was a, a flip and write game called Let's Make a Bus Route, where you had Yeah, all... yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes, it sort of sounds like a Partridge Family song. Um, where y- you were collaboratively building uh, on a single map bus routes all over town, trying to tag different locations to earn points. But you were colliding with the other players. Not really colliding, because that would be tragic in a bus. Um, you yeah, are it's a board game, so who cares? Meshing up with routes, and you would get penalties for, for being in congested zones. If you went on the same areas as other players, you would have penalties. Now, the latest version of this, new iteration, is Let's Make a Bus Route, the dice game. Uh, which is brand new, uh, should be releasing very soon. And the company says international shipping is going to be part of their their new website relaunch. So that'll be good news for a lot of people who like the Sashi and Sashi Sashi games. In the dice version of Let's Make a Bus Route, there is only one or two players. You can play solo or with one other opponent. um, And it uses dice instead of cards to sort of randomize what you're doing. I would not have guessed. You know. Uh, The dice have symbols on them that represent stuff like uh, tourists or commuters or students or elderly people. Um, And you will roll a big mess of them, like six, six white dice. uh, And then you choose, if you are the first player in the two-player game, you choose three of those dice and mark down symbols on your board. Uh, Then the other player looks at the remaining dice and chooses one of those that corresponds to a a root plan, like a zigzag or just a right angle turn or even just a single root segment. And then they will draw that on the map. So on a particular turn, you're either going to tag symbols on your board or you're going to draw your root. And a lot of the, the special symbols will earn you points if you manage to tag different spots. So the tourists want to go to tourist locations, and the commuters want to go to train stations. And uh, there are parents and children that are matching up symbols, and if you circle them on your map, then you can mark them on your board. It's, it's all about doing things on each turn, on the, the symbol turn and the root building turn. And then once you've both done that, the start player marker moves, and then you begin the sequence again. After 12 turns of this, um, when you've been the start player 12 times, 
that's the end of the game and you score up points. Uh, there are special abilities that you can charge up by using some of these symbols that let you roll an extra die or, or flip to whatever symbol you want or simply just re-roll uh, your dice. There are penalties for crossing the other player's routes. That's, that's congested traffic. In fact, there's areas of the board that'll earn you negative points. Um, and also you can take penalties for straightening out your route or adding a curve where you're not supposed to. <laughs> That, that sort of thing. If you um, use too many of the same style of root, you, you have to sort of manipulate them in order to make them. Wait, better. what's the... I got the other stuff. That made sense. What's yep. the theming behind that? Uh, so if I choose a particular symbol uh, on the dice to, to do, say, a, uh, a straight, three straights, but I can't fit three straights from the position I'm at on the board. So I can take a penalty to make one of those straights a turn. So Got I go straight, it. straight, oh, okay. turn. Um, and that, that's, you know, a negative penalty. And uh, you, you total up, most points wins. Uh, the solo game is an interesting twist because you basically play the game twice. You play once with the blue marker and, uh, and make your route, try and score as many points as you want. And then you will play again, but the blue route stays on the board. So Against you have to, yourself. You, play, you actually total your score and you try and reach different thresholds. But... Uh, the fact that you are now trying to maneuver around what you already did in the previous round, you also get to pass along some of those special abilities you may have charged up uh, in the course of the game. This is a lovely production. It's got a two-sided board. There's a city map and a Mars map that has some warp points that are kind of cool. Um, the box lid has a padded section, so it acts as a nice little dice tray. Um, just really thoughtful production in the whole thing. It's all dry erase markers, too. It's... um. You know, it's not not sheets of paper, but dry erase boards for all of this. Uh, if you are a fan of Let's Make a Bus Route or you've wanted to check it out, but you only have uh, one other opponent to play with or just playing on your own, it's a, a lovely thing to check out. Let's Make a Bus Route, the dice game. Now, here's the question. Which would you rather play? Well, I, it, it really, they're different They're audiences. different, Tom. I know. <laughs> well, they are. I mean, the... I don't know if if Let's Make a Bus Route, the Big Brother, works well as a two-player. I haven't played it as a two-player game. Um, I, I kind of like the the three to five player experience for Let's Make a Bus Route, and so they, it's it's they're totally different animals um, doing kind of the same thing. I think I'd prefer the multiplayer. I'd like to have more of that interaction and traffic uh, going on as everyone's building their routes around. But this is a charming little uh, variant on the whole thing. All right. All right, it's time for you to review a, a TV station. Uh, next up, yes, this is a TV station, is Bravo. Uh, this is a new release from Stronghold Games. It's from Inca and Marcus Brand, uh, who are, are well known for the Exit series, but they've done a few of these roll and rights. And in fact, this is sort of an iteration of they have another game called Encore, uh, which was also a Stronghold roll and write. Uh, you, you have a, this one's a sheet of paper, uh, and you. Oh! Be- I'm sorry, Eric, I didn't know what game you were talking about. Oh. And then I remembered it, but you need to warn people that this cover is the thing you always complain about. <laughs> it is. You're right. The, the cover is um, a bunch of dice exploding out of... It's almost a requirement that if you're going to do a roll and write... <laughs> it's, so, it's so ridiculous at this point. I, I literally cannot tell them apart. You, you even, have to have Even saying explode. the name of the company doesn't help. Like, Eric's like, Stronghold. This is like the seventh one they've done. They they do have a... And they're all in the same size box, so they can be shelved together. It's it's lovely. Um, However, so it's Bra- the brand, so I'm assuming it's good. Uh, Bravo uses um, color... It's a it's a grid. You know, the board that you're working with is a grid of of color clusters. So you might have three red squares next to five green squares, and they all sort of snake around the board. Uh, you have to start building from the center, and then you can sort of build out, uh, building off of the marks that you have made. On your turn, if you are the one rolling the dice, you're going to roll a bunch of dice. Some of them are color dice, and some are number dice, uh, and there's also one special die. And ordinarily, you're going to pick one color and one number. Say I I pick a three and a red, and I will put three marks on red squares. Uh, If I do it right, I'm filling up entire clusters if I can. Uh, But sometimes I have to fill less than that. I cannot, however, um, I have to make exactly that number of marks on my board. So if I don't have the ability to put three red marks in the same zone... I, I'm, I can't choose that combination of dice. I have to be able to use all the marks I can 
Uh, I could always pass and do nothing, but that's not, not, that's not, not making any progress. Um, I'm trying to complete these groupings and complete rows and columns, which will earn me bonuses. I can put out, um, you know, trigger those bonuses to to put additional marks on the board or or get additional point scoring opportunities. It's it's all about triggering all of these these special powers. Um, there's also a special ability die that I can trigger instead of choosing a pair of dice. And uh, I can only do that so many times during the game, but there are some very powerful abilities like crossing off an entire cluster at once or, or three of anything in one row, and, and it helps me complete those rows and columns. Uh, of course, there are bonuses for completing columns before the other players, and there's um, ways you can charge up other scoring opportunities. It's, it's a neat spatial game. Um, and, and not, I mean, of these, um, roll and writes are number based, you know, it just feels like you're right. writing numbers all over the place. This one's much more about creating clusters. And, and, uh, so if you're more of a, a, a <laughs> geometrical as opposed to oh, a mathematical okay. mind, this, this is more of a fit for you. Uh, I liked it. The, the solo version has you again, trying to get as many points as possible. Um, I, I don't think the solo version works as well because you don't have that competition, of trying to score something before other players. You, you don't have that, that as an element at all um, in, in trying to, uh, to race to complete a, a column or a row before the other, other folks. And, and I think that's missing something. So I would certainly recommend this as a multiplayer game, not as much as a solo experience. Um, but it's, it's, a, it's a fun um, geometrical experience. Bravo. Yeah, that's... that's... They're going to quote you in the back of the box on that one. A fun geometrical experience. Eric Summer. Yep. I'm, I'm hoping so. I'm going for that. Let's talk about a game that I thought would get more buzz, but seemingly has not. Hmm. Well, I'd, how long has this one been out, I guess is the question. I don't know. I, maybe I played it. Uh, we played it during one of our spectaculars. I want to say the Winter Spectacular. So just okay. a few months, I guess. I just thought it would have a bigger buzz, and, and we're talking, folks, about Santorini, New York. Santorini, New York. Uh, I just uh, got an opportunity to play for the first time. Uh, I, in fact, I have never played Santorini uh, <gasps> somehow. Yeah, I know. Uh, it's it's one that I've always known is well regarded and uh, have seen set up, and I I know it's a lovely, beautiful production, but I've never. Never had the uh, opportunity to play. So I am new to the Santorini system. Santorini, New York um, is set in New York. It has, I think, original Santorini is a square using its map. Uh, this is more of a, it's a Manhattan-shaped map uh, with, with some more like blind corners and, and you know, narrowing of the board. It's more of an oblong um, geography. The object of Santorini... New York is to uh, is to win on your turn uh, if you have the the little Statue of Liberty in front of you uh, by either stepping up onto a third level building or to build a roof on a third level on the third level of a building while you are holding the uh, the statue and if you you get the statue if you play the highest numbered card. Uh, and in a particular round, you've, you've got a hand of cards, they all have numbers, and uh, you will simultaneously play one, you all flip them up, and then you play in number order. So if you want the opportunity to win, you have to play one of the higher numbers. Um, and then the other players are, are, of course, acting before you to try and prevent you from winning. Um, there are abilities uh, for, for each of these suits of cards, and they get swapped out based on what game you're playing. There's a sort of an initial setup of four that they suggest you start with, but then you can swap out the right. purple cards. You can swap out the green cards. Um, and so One set's them... in every game, though. The sure. set that gives you the Statue of Liberty. Yes, there's, there's the engineer that's always in every game. Um, so there is, uh, there are some that let you build multiple pieces. You, you basically move one of your two workers around the board and then build one level of building um, in an open space or making another building taller. As long as no one's standing there or it's not a completed building already, you can make it bigger. Um, and you will uh, continue doing this until somebody... Uh, reaches a win condition. There's also one, the engineer character has you building skyscrapers, which sort of block oh, off sections great. of the board. Um, the game is all about, it's a very abstract game. Um, it's all about preventing a situation where your opponent can then win the game. Uh, this is not a concept that my children really understood. 
in, in playing this. They, they did fine with it, but this is one of those that you have to sort of see where the danger is in letting your opponent have a particular scoring opportunity. And, and they were much more focused on uh, building their own possibilities for winning and not seeing how I was ready to do something. And so they, so they made some moves. They're like, yeah, this is great for me two turns from now. And then went, oh, dad's going to win now. And so it was that that's certainly a, a level of thinking in this game that they haven't quite reached. Um, but this game offers those opportunities uh, and and uh, future plays should be far more contentious uh, as we go through it. The production is lovely. The um, the little squares where you're putting all these buildings are, are recessed. It's a dual layer board. Um, the the figurines, the. Uh, the Statue of Liberty piece is really cool. The buildings themselves, the roofs you put on them, the skyscrapers. It looks gorgeous on the table. Um, my only complaint is that the, some of the linen finish was a little wonky on some of the cards, but that's a really minor issue. It's not like you're... It, the secret information is not really something that, that's a problem with these cards, so you can play with them just fine, and if it really bothers you, you can sleeve them. Um, everything else is, is lovely. Uh, and this is Santorini, New York, from Spin Master and Roxley. I think is the the dual. Um, yeah, it's group. it's really a Spin Master production because Roxley's production, the original one that they made, was much higher quality. Hmm. Um, I like Santorini better than Santorini, New York, but Santorini, New York handles more players better. Yeah, I always thought well, Santorini was a two-player game, or at least it was presented as such. two to three, but I don't think I ever want to play it with three. I okay. want to play it with two. This plays up to five, I think. Yeah, and I think it handles that pretty well. I mean, you could still play it with two. It's not a problem, but I like it a lot. Hmm. Yeah, I, I really enjoy it, and I think it's one that, that we'll be able to bring out with the kids more often. All right, folks, I'm going to talk about four games that are probably for kids, maybe not. Um, and I'm going to review them. In, I got four of them, and I'm going to do them in order of how interesting Eric will want to – how much Eric will want to play each one. So okay. we'll start with the lowest and go to the highest. Excellent. You can tell me if I'm wrong based on the descriptions, but I feel like I got your number. Okay. All right, so the first one's the simplest one. It's called The Quest Kids. This is a game that is probably outside – Eric's wheelhouse with your children right now because it says five plus on the box mm -hmm. and that's not too far off actually it's a game in which you lay down a there's a big dungeon and you lay down a whole bunch of cards at the beginning based on some patterns and you then have characters that will have still have some starting cards there's like three different cards that like magic fighting and wisdom I forget there's like three colors red purple yellow and on your turn you can move your character these big plastic miniatures to any room that you can get to at the beginning of the game you can only get to a couple rooms but as you turn over cards you can get to more and more rooms so there's no movement you just go to an open card do you flip the card over sometimes it gives you more cards sometimes it lets you pull treasure out of a bag and you'll just pull treasure out of a bag that will give you a couple points sometimes you lose a few points from this treasure there's not good treasure and some treasures give you more points if it matches your player color so like if you're the yellow Wizard and you pull a treasure it might be worth four points. Um, th but there's also monsters on these cards. So you'll turn over a monster and you got to kill that monster. To defeat the monster, you might need two red cards, two yellow cards, and two purple cards. You know, so you do that and you beat the monster and he's worth a certain number of points. If you can't beat the monster, you will lose a health and health. You, you never die. Like, if, if you lose your last health card, I think you start with three of them. You just come back in the next round, back in the game. But each health card's worth two points. So if you lose them, you lose some points at the end of the game. But the fact is, is you almost never lose health. And why? Because whenever you fight a monster, you can other players can help you. So if I need two yellows, two purples, but I don't have any reds, Eric, you could play two reds to help me out. Okay. Now, why would you do that? I still get the monster. I still get the points. But you, for each card you play, you get these helper cards that um, uh, that give you all sorts of, of bonuses and all sorts of different things. You know, they, it's like, hey, I helped. And you might get some extra life. You might get some extra treasure that you get to pull from the bag. It's always worth it to help other people out. So it's not a cooperative game. At the end of the game, once you've explored everything and there's nothing else you can do, you are going to discount up your points and who has most points wins. 
but it offers some good choices and decisions. And for a younger kid, I was very impressed with it. It was my son's favorite game for a week. Okay. Until it was displaced by my second game I'm talking about. <laughs> maybe maybe he's increasing with his uh, his skills. Or he's next... cult of the new. <laughs> no, I don't think that's it, actually. <laughs> In fact, my kids kind of chafe against the cult of the new thing. I'll be like, I got a new game. They're like, but what about the one we already know how to play? Yeah, I hear you. Like you should have had a different parent then. Anyhow, so the next one is Andor. Uh, oh, from Inc- this is the family version of Legends of Andor. That's correct. It is also from Ink and Marcus Brand, who made that nondescript role right Eric mentioned earlier. Bravo! Yeah, no one's going to remember that. Seriously, no one will. <laughs> uh, but Andor here, so Legends of Andor is a game that I like. I don't love it. Z likes it a lot more than I do. Um, it's it's more of a puzzly adventure game Mm -hmm. you have some people they go across the land you fight monsters but fighting monsters isn't always the best thing to do this game's very similar in fact it's it's really similar but it's made for kids you have a land and a bunch of fog tokens and you each have very distinct characters and you'll be spending action points to move out there your goal is to complete some tasks and based on what level you're playing you have various tasks like like the level one you got to go take a falcon back to the veterinarian in the city and you got to go uh, find a couple plants for the alchemist or something. Uh, once you complete these tasks, you can then go into the cave and you're finding three wolf cubs. You find these three wolf cubs, you win. Uh, meanwhile, there's a dragon moving towards the city. And there's monsters that show up on the board that if you don't stop them, they make the dragon fly faster. And if he gets to the city, he wins. Hmm. It's simple. It's fun. It's, in my opinion... Very, very lucky. But okay. again, it gives you some straight-up choices to play. It's a cooperative game. Everyone's working together. But I like the aspects of it. I was talking to Z because it's been a long time since I played Andor, or Legends of Andor. So he said that the, there's a lot of similarities between the games. But this one works well for kids, and my son is able to get most of it. There's some times where I'm like, listen, you don't need to use your movement points to run all the way over there without maybe stopping at these three places along the way. Let's take our time. Let's not just run until there comes a point where you do run. Yeah. So that's Andor. Okay. I don't know, Eric, that your kids may be... This may be down their alley. Maybe. May... We, we played Legends of Andor, and they had no trouble with it. So this might be one that we're... Yeah, beyond. you know what? Then Then don't go backwards, right? Right. Now, the next one, uh, every every father should buy his, his, his children, and that's Catapult Kingdoms. Now, Catapult Kingdoms was a Kickstarter that I backed. Okay. And it showed up, and then I was like, oh, this is Crossbows and Catapults. Yeah. <laughs> you, you have this then. I, I don't, but I, I was hoping that, that you'd say something along those lines. Oh. <laughs> Actually... If we're going to be specific, it's closer to weapons and warriors. Okay. When, when we were kids, and most people are, my, mine and Eric's age, no crossbows and catapults. This was a game in which you had a castle and you were trying to shoot people off your opponent's castle with discs. And you had various weapons, um, a catapult, uh, a, maybe a crossbow type thing, a ballista mm-hmm. style thing. There were was, was certain engines you could buy expansions for it. Yeah, the so the competitor was better than just about anything else. Yeah, the, yeah I, I think you're right. Um, Weapons and Warriors was the same thing, but instead of discs, it used orange balls that bounced off a room and got lost. Oh. So this is similar to Weapons Warriors because they're balls, but they're like Nerf balls. Um, Nerf, they're, they're harder than Nerf. Um, okay. Like a, like a harder foam ball. They, yeah, but they yeah. wouldn't hurt if you got hit with one. And so I, I must have got everything. So I got, I got some catapults and then i got some uh, like a cannon <laughs> and then i got the the ballista yep. and then there's a pirate ship and there's also a volcano but i will say the volcano is a humongous waste of money okay um so don't get that folks but the rest of it it's straight up you get all these little these uh plastic pieces they're like they look like legos except they're they're, they're bigger than legos but they're plastic blocks but they don't connect to each other you just build a castle you put your guys on that castle and then you take turns shooting back and forth, but there's also a deck of action cards that you can play to do different things. Okay. That's it. 
Um, the one I actually, I think my favorite is the, I think it's the cannon set. It shoots beehives. So the, instead of balls, they're shaped like beehives. And the, the material of these is like a, an eraser. Okay. So when they land on the table, they just bounce. You don't know where they're going next. <laughs> so sometimes you can do this amazing shot. You're like, oh, I, you know, and oh, me and my son are having so much fun with this. But I wasn't surprised at it because he just like shooting stuff across the room. Why not? Who wouldn't? It's, I don't know what else to tell you. you if, if you're my description, you know if you want it or not. <laughs> but I have a lot of fond memories of playing this game when I was a kid. There's something satisfying about seeing a shot hit a wall. And in fact, one of the armies, I don't know why it's only one of the armies. One of the armies has their their finger, their thumbs in their ears and waggling their fingers at you. They're like taunting you to hit them. <laughs> I don't know why it's only the one army. I think it's funny. <laughs> but I, I, I really like this. I'm glad I have it. It's the kind of game I'll play with my son, you know, until, you know, until he gets bored. And then I'll stick it in the closet. And when the grandkids start showing up, which are not on the way or even close, folks, okay. I'm just saying, when that happens someday, I'm prepared. All right. Uh, last game I want to talk about is Spinboard Ghost Adventure. Okay. This is uh, from Buzzy Games. It says Spinboard on it, and I don't know if that's a brand of games or if it's a brand of tops. Because this game is about spinning tops. Well... I knew you would like this because this reminds me of a lot of the Haba games we played back in the day. You know, you roll the ball around. So this game comes with four double-sided, triple-layer boards. Um, Triple-layer, you say? Well, the reason I say they're triple-layer is because they, each side of the board, there's a, it shows like a kingdom, like part of a fantasy kingdom with different symbols all over it. And, but there's three levels so what happens is, the, the base game is, you have a mission that you need to do. You're a ghost mouse, and you're going around and rescuing the kingdom. There's actually a comic book sort that comes with the game, and as you go through each mission, it gives you a comic with no words that you still get, you know, what you're trying to do. And so it will, the ease, it will start at the easy levels. There's another whole book without the comic book that has like another 20 levels you can play. But the levels will say... You need to go to this spot on this board, then go to this spot on this board, then go to this spot on this board, etc. Sometimes you do multiple spots on the same board. Sometimes you'll go from one board back to the other board. But the boards are all separate. So we have this top, and there's two tops included in the game. You can use a regular top that you spin with your fingers, or it has a bay blade type top. Ah. And I don't know which one I like better, because I can spin with my fingers pretty fast. Mm-hmm. But either way, you pick the starting board, and there's like a portal on each board. You spin it, and then one person, and it's a cooperative game. You can play one to four players. You are manipulating it through the different ridges to get to the thing you want. But like I said, there's three levels, so sometimes you need to get to a higher level. So you have to go find, there's like jump points. You go to a jump point, and if you're on that, then you're allowed to jerk the thing a little bit to make the top jump to a higher level. <laughs> okay. Eventually, you get to the symbol you need to get to. You need to go to the other board. So then each of these boards has an exit point. So you go to that exit point and then another player brings the board up and you drop it onto their board. And then they're working through their board. Oh. Now, now because the people who made this are, are, are not fun, they also put holes and swamps and jagged edges on these boards. And um, <clears throat> I thought... I th we lost on level two. I'm just saying, uh, but I mean, we re we redid it and won. Also, when your top stops spinning, then you you have these potions. You just flip a potion over, okay, and you can start the top again at the at the last checkpoint. So gotcha. when you go to a new board, the spot that you drop it onto is the checkpoint. Because I don't think you could spin the top fast enough to do the whole thing in one spin, right? Maybe if you, oh, I shouldn't say that. I'm sure there's people out there who can do it. There's people out there who can do amazing things. Mm -hmm. But for us, us, you know, ordinary people. Yeah. But this really reminded me of a Haba game in, in, in the way that that was presented. You know, I don't remember if you remember the rolling game with the marbles and you rolled them underneath the animal's legs, I magnets on the board, one. or, you know, they have all sorts of weird games like that, though. Right. And this one uses spinning tops, and it's a gimmick. 
but it's an entertaining one. And it's also a game, obviously, meant to be played with families. But I could see a bunch of adults playing it, you know? Yeah. And I also know that this is the kind of game you would want to play. Hmm. Sounds a little bit like um, Slide Quest, except you're manipulating a top instead of a roller knight. Yeah, if you like Slide Quest, you would like this game. Now, I think some people will have a harder time with it because it does require you to move a top that's spinning on a board and knowing which way to tilt the board. And, of course, there's the vagaries of a spinning top. Sometimes it doesn't matter what you did. It messes up. And there's different spots on the board. Like there's a teleport spots. If you go to a teleport spot, then you're allowed to just jump right to any other spot in someone else's board. Uh, again, that's not easy. You still yeah. have to do it. <laughs> we found we lost a lot of momentum trans- whenever we moved the top from one board to the other. Hmm. That was the biggest thing. And of course, oh, and also you, you're allowed to restart your spin twice. So like when you first do your spin, you're like, yeah, it's not a good spin. <laughs> everyone, everyone who's ever used the top knows what I'm talking about. Yeah, yeah. You start spinning, you're like, oh, no, 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 that doesn't count. <laughs> you know, when you're spinning to see who can spin it the longest. Right. Okay. Yeah, so that's, uh, it's called Spinboard Ghost Adventure. So I don't know if Spinboard, like I said, I looked it up online and I couldn't find it like a company called Spinboard. Yeah. So I don't know if this is like a line of games that they're going to do lots of these top games. I don't know that you need more than one. Hmm. Like if someone said, we made another one, I'd say, ah. This is a fun gimmick, but I mean, it's 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 this one game, but it's Ghost Adventure. So I don't know if it's Spinboard Ghost Adventure or just Ghost Adventure, but either way. And the art is amazing. The quality of the boards is really well done. The tops are good. They even provide you with, I think, like eight more center pieces and tips for the tops in case they break. Oh, okay. Yeah, I was pretty impressed with it. So okay. that's the games we played. Let's keep moving. Support for this episode comes from The Op, presenting The Batman Who Laughs Rising. Save the multiverse and the Justice League with The Batman Who Laughs Rising from The Op. From the Dark Knight Metal comic series, the evil hybrid of Batman and the Joker, The Batman Who Laughs is determined to destroy the multiverse and the Justice League needs to stop him. In this cooperative dice engine building game, gather your team and roll the dice to stop darkness from sweeping over the multiverse. Featuring characters from across the DC Universe, recruit heroes to fight the Batman Who Laughs. Included is a big Batman Who Laughs figure, full color, unique sculpt for the game. The co-op Dice Rolling Rising series puts players in a game against the clock. Can you survive and save the multiverse? The Batman Who Laughs Rising is available now at theop.games or your local game store. And now, another tale of board gaming horror. Oh my, that's horrific. Gather round, children. We have recently bought Clask as a family game to occupy the children during lockdown. It has been very popular and has been played every day for about a month. I was playing against my daughter, aged ten, and she was up two to zero. The next point was tightly fought when all of a sudden she screamed in pain. Crying, she held out her thumb and showed me she had a splinter from colliding her thumb with the underside of the game. The splinter had gone into her thumb all the way under the nail and was just poking out the top. We could see the splinter through her nail. Using tweezers, I just managed to get hold of it and pulled it out. The splinter was over two centimeters long. This is longer than her nail. Crying through the pain, she asked if this meant she had won the game. I offered to keep playing, and when she refused, I told her she had to forfeit. (laughs) <laughs> See, you thought the horror was the splinter, but no, it said he was mean. I debated actually putting like a uh, a disclaimer before there, because I know some people Content don't like the warning. <laughs> yeah, I mean it's a splinter, but uh, I, I he he sent me a picture of it, folks. The splinter, not not the embedded splinter, just the splinter itself next to a ruler to prove <laughs> that it was long. Um, so real quick before we get angry emails and such. When this person sent it in, I said, 
you realize that the audience is going to turn against you here, right? <laughs> and and uh, they told me that a couple days later they finished the game. Oh, good. So so that's all good. It's a happy end. <laughs> I just love, you're injured, you forfeit. <laughs> yeah, if you can't play, I guess I win. All righty, well, there you go, folks. Let's jump to some questions. Mm-hmm. Questions. 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 Steven asks, I was wondering how you determine what games your kids can handle, or do you base it on the suggested age group? Do you open it up first and read the rules, or do you just take it out and see what happens? Second question is, do you think with the amount of board games coming out and their increase in mature content, do you think they may have a rating system soon, similar to video games and movies like Rated R or Rated Y? What are your thoughts? Well, let's answer these separately because they're different questions. The first one, yeah. about kids, um, it depends on the age of the kids. So my younger children... I usually play games with them that are for kids, right? But I'll open right. the game up and look. So recently I got a game that said six and up. And I was like, oh, I'll play this with my son. I opened it up and there was so much reading in the game. Hmm. And he can't read that well yet. And I was like, okay, gotcha. that won't work for him. But I always give the game a cursory look over. With my older kids, I'm just wildly guessing. Um, the same as I would do if you were in my game group. Right. <laughs> I, but here's the thing and then this leads into the second question but i'll explain that in a second I'll, I'll let eric do his answer i i i think um i mean the suggested age group oh that's balderdash it, by the way yeah that that can you can be led astray by that so i i definitely need to look at the rules or or at least know what the mechanisms are uh before i would suggest that it be good for for my kids or or when my kids were younger I would definitely need to know how the game works before trying it out and not just well it says 7 and up on the box so you know you should be able to handle it I, there it's I need more more specificity than that Yeah so what I was going to say with my kids is when it comes to the older kids and I play games I don't actually worry about what he what what Steven says about mature content because it's so rare like a game that has it is usually really obvious. Like rage, no, I'm sorry, hate, hate, or you know, <laughs> yes. these there's games with maybe blood and gore and stories. Yeah. Those are pretty. I I can tell those apart. But like almost every Euro game, there's no mature content in it. It's about building building somewhere or you know farming a farm or something like that. Yeah. Um, I don't think we really need a rating system. It's not like video games. The you know, if you come to the Dice Tower Library, the vast, I think if I was like, kids, don't look at this game, it might be like three, maybe? <laughs> I, I, I can't, I, I don't know. I just don't think it's a necessary thing. Yeah, I mean, we, we sort of do have have this already when the publisher puts a, an age more than 14 on the box. If they're saying, if they're saying 17 plus on the game, well, there's obviously some sort of content in there that you don't want your younger kids playing. Um, the, I mean, the, the both the video game and the movie rating systems came from controversy, more or less, when when parents were outraged by something that was on the screen uh, for one of these things. And I don't think we have that as much in board games, where, where parents have said, how, how could it possibly be that this game was presented to my small children? Um it's much more rare. Right. Um, but the, if it does say more than 14 plus on a game, then there's there's some sort of reason. I would say it. more than, but realize some games say 13 plus just because they didn't feel like getting it tested. Right. But the, the main three things that people get upset over are essentially um, sex. Um, well, I, there may, I guess there's more than that. that was just, there's language um, mm. and uh, violence. <laughs> slash gore, maybe drugs, alcohol. Actually, I think the drugs, alcohol thing would probably be the thing you find the most across board yeah. games. And, and Usually in a humorous context. Sure. Um, language is very rare. I can think of maybe a few games where I've noticed it. Um, violence is the one that there's going to be a lot of, but you don't actually see the violence. Mm -hmm. You know, like if I have a miniature killing another miniature, that's kind of 
on you to determine whether that is a good or bad thing. Yeah, and also, you know, with the international nature of board game design, um, what what may be intense for one group of people is not a problem for others and vice versa, um, which we've certainly seen uh, with, with international design groups being different from the sensibilities of, say, the U.S. The, there's a few, I, I think the most stark one I can think of in recent years would be that escape room game that Eric played. <laughs> yes, the 50 clues. But even most escape rooms are like very, very family friendly. Yeah. Uh, uh, well, even the the ones, I guess the ones from uh, Board and Dice, those are very dark escape yeah, tales. Yeah. But yeah. they're more dark. Well, they're just dark themed. Yeah. Anyway, I, I, yeah, I don't think there's going to be a committee uh, rating them. But that's very similar to our next question from Ryan. Yes. He gets annoyed, he says, a point of frustration when he buys a game that says two to six, but the two to three player games aren't very good. Or if it says 60 minutes when it really takes 150 minutes. Uh As a side note, I just got a new 18XX game, and I want to say it's 1820 maybe, I forget, for the library. And on the side of the box, it said five to seven hours. And I thought, oh boy, huh? Truth in advertising. I was, I was impressed by that, Eric. Because I knew wow. they were telling the truth. Yes. Yeah. You're not going to put that on a box unless it actually is going to take that long. <laughs> yeah. But anyway, yes, most most game boxes tend to lie in this regard. Um, so Ryan says, would it be worth it to have an independent group to start giving them ratings similar to TV, movies, and video games, but with a special emphasis on age, player count, and duration? <laughs> um, it's been independently tested to be 30 minutes or less. Yeah, and he says, I'm kind of guessing the answer is no, but as the board game hobby grows, I could see this becoming valuable someday. Well, guess what? That already exists. It's just that it is, it's crowdsourced, and that's on BoardGameGeek.com. BoardGameGeek.com, if you go there and you look at each game, it will say best with something, the number of players. People vote Mm -hmm. on that. They'll also will say, there's different ways, and and you can find that information out online. If the game is longer than it says on the box, I guarantee you people will say that. I understand your frustration when you buy a game that says two to something. This usually happens with two players, and the two-player variant is a very different experience that you may right. not like. Or yeah. um, the opposite, you know, where there's even you know the bigger number of players doesn't work very well. But to that, I can only say you got to do your research when you're looking at the game. Yeah, it's it's hard because these are marketing messages uh, on the side of the box. Uh, we we have sort of over the years gotten a a pretty standard layout for these things. You know, you get the the age range and the number of players and the amount of time it takes to play. I have seen some um, of those number of players graphics separate out the two. Or to separate out the one for the solo version to say this is a, a you know a variant it can be played or it'll say two to five players and then it will say solo variant included so that it is a separate thing from simply saying one to five. Um, it would be nice if there was some uniform way of saying that, but also I'm not sure that the publishers would want to say that they want it to appeal to the widest group of people as possible, and so they're just going to put. Two to five or one to five on the side of the box. Dave is a bit behind on listening to the podcast and has been catching up. Recently listened to an episode from the end of the year 2019 in which me, Eric, uh, made a wish that I'm curious if it came true. Eric was lamenting how many games he was behind and needed to catch up and wished that maybe the board game industry would just stop making games for a few months so he could catch up. Two months later, bam, Corona. Uh, I'm not saying Eric caused the outbreak, but I'm curious if his wish came true. How much did the industry slow down once the outbreak hit? Also, since I'm backlogged on podcasts, I've been binge listening to them. I'm currently up to July 21st, 2020, and I've noticed that when Tom really doesn't like a game but doesn't want to call it bad, he says, it's fine. Maybe that should be a new advice, a new Dice Tower t-shirt. I don't mean, uh, that doesn't mean I don't like the game. It means I find it okay. Yeah. Um, back to the question. There was, we did have a pause um, in those first few months when everything just stopped. Well, uh, there was a couple reasons for that. That's because China shut down. Yes. 
And that's where most yes, of yes. the games were made. Uh, and then, of course, American America shut down except for Essentials, but that was only that was a that was frankly a very short time where only the Essentials were running. Yes. <sighs> And some companies ran out of money. Uh, but here's the thing. The board game industry is still doing really well. I looked. I forget where I saw it. I saw the numbers of new releases in 2020. And mm-hmm. it was less than 2019. But barely. I think it was It was more of a hiccup than a full stop. It really was. And honestly, you wouldn't notice. Because the fact was it was so uphill that a, a year with slightly fewer releases than the previous year is still more than, let's say, 2013. Right. Um, I did feel like I caught up a little bit during that period, but I've also had the restriction of who I can play with. So uh, while I did get a few games uh, to the table, they were only the ones that could be played with my kids. Right. So there's that. Yeah, I think all of us, though, you know, I joke about it a lot in the show. And like I said, I was mentioning to Eric beforehand, there's so many games coming out. You have to be content. You're never going to catch them all. <laughs> They're it's true. It's, it's never going to happen. So why feel bad about it? It's why I gave up on Pokemon. And, and just, just can't just to, cl- <laughs> just to clarify, I will often give Eric, I'll be like, I can't believe you played this game, but I don't really mean that. In a sense of, I don't really think Eric should have played all these games. Because, first right. of all, he has another job. And secondly, <laughs> it's not possible. I play more games than most people in the world. I feel that's a, a reasonable assumption. I would agree. Yeah. I definitely play more bad games than anyone else on Earth. Um, but, even I can't get to all these games. Even I don't, I don't even get to... Uh, uh, I don't think I play... Even 20% of all the games that come out over the course of a year. Now, I play the majority of the quote-unquote big releases, Mm -hmm. but I can't play all the games. It's impossible. But I've also, I've come to terms with that. If I go to the studio and Z's grabbed the game and he's reviewing it, and I was like, but I wanted to play, you know what? I'll play a different one. (laughs) That's just (laughs) the way it's got to go. Curtis says, he first he says some nice things to us. Uh, but he moved, he said he made it bearable moving seven hours from his game group. But he found a new one. Hooray. So he says he's been in the board game world for about an hour and a half. He talks about board he's games. He's been in the board game world for an hour and a half. Oh, and he spent some of that writing to us. That's <laughs> a year and a half. Sorry. <laughs> okay. <laughs> he's talking about board game all the time. And when non-gamers hear I play board games, he gets a standard question. Is it like Monopoly or Risk? And then he tries to explain modern board games to no avail. How yep. do we explain modern board games we all love to play? Um, especially in all those times that we talk to people these days. Yeah, sure. Um, I mean, yes. Uh, and he said, I, I'm sure you've answered this before, but but an update would be good. Um, I will often say, yeah, like Monopoly or Risk. Uh, do, you, do you like Monopoly or Risk? And, and ask... Um, you know, what do they like? And from that point, I can say, well, yeah, actually, I play a lot of games just like that. Here's a bunch that that you'd probably like. And, oh, well, you know, Monopoly and Risk are pretty old games. People have been continually designing games since then. There's all sorts of new releases. Or where where you can say now, or at least when people were heading into the big box stores, you can say, hey, have you been in a Target or a, uh, a Barnes & Noble lately? Uh, they're, have you looked at the game section over there? And they're like, oh, yeah, there were a bunch of things I never saw before. Yeah, that's the stuff I'm playing these days. So it's easier with that context. Yeah, I think it's really important. Unless the only time I will say something even slightly negative about Monopoly is if they'll say, oh, is it like Monopoly? And I'll be like, oh, yeah, it's a lot like the games like Monopoly and Scrabble. If they're like, oh, I don't really like Monopoly, I'll go, well, you know what? Neither do I, but these games are so much better. <laughs> but that's the only time I'll do that. Yeah. Because if you go, well, not like Monopoly, let me tell you. Like, oh, no, it's comic book guy. He's coming. <laughs> no, you just need to. You just, and, and it also depends what the person's asking about. If someone says to me, for example, if I just run into someone and we're doing something else and they say, oh, I'm a fisherman. I'm like, oh. And they're like, I, I, you know, I fish in deep, deep, I do deep sea fishing. And I'm like, oh, that sounds interesting. 
that's me being a little bit polite. <laughs> I don't need them to explain to me all the details of deep sea fishing. Maybe, maybe right. uh, and, and you know what, maybe I would actually, but I found that most people, when they find out I'm a, I do board games for a living, they're more interested in the fact that I do it for a living. They're not that interested in hearing about all the different board games. I'd say maybe yeah. one out of 10, maybe. Okay. Yeah. Most people are just being polite. They'll be interested for a little while, then they want to talk about something else. I mean, I'd be kind of interested in hearing about deep sea fishing. That sounds cool. Well, there's a lot of that down here in South Florida. <laughs> That's what. Oh, I guess I guess it's far more um, likely um, than than me being in Northern Connecticut. There's very little uh, freshwater fishing here, actually, at where <laughs> I live. You know, it's mostly saltwater fishing. I, I, anyway, what I'm saying is, there's there's always gonna be something I'm not that interested in. Occasionally, people will go off on something, and I'm like, okay, and I'll listen politely, but you don't need to evangelize everyone you meet. Sometimes right. just a word here or there. Your better bet is at a party bringing a really simple party game, getting everyone excited about that, and then maybe if you find someone who's like who really liked it, you might show them a, a, a more strategic Gloomhaven. game. <laughs> it's like a trap. You're standing outside with a Gloomhaven box and a stick underneath it. Underneath We're that. playing gestures, and then after that's over, <laughs> boom. We begin the campaign now. Tim says, with the rise of at-home 3D resin printers, do you think there's a place for these printers in the board game hobby? A a possible component renaissance in the future? Uh, I had two main thoughts on this. Could there be a possibility of two editions of games? One that is a full-priced base game with components, dice, miniatures, and cards all in the box. Then a possible cheaper second edition where the miniatures would come as pre-supported STL files. Letting people who have the technology to print spend less, but get the quality they prefer in material or size of the components. Then just imagine the possibility of upgrading components. As an example, Terraforming Mars has a first player token on the Board Game Geek website. Companies could include files in the base boxes to upgrade small components, such as first player tokens, that just add to the aesthetic of the game on the table. It could act like some games that add download codes for apps in the box. If you want to use it, you can use it, and it's there. The approach could also lead to future expansions that could just be STL files, upgrading components to miniatures from the wooden meeples or standees. Of course, there would be the problem of people with this technology reselling the products if they could print. That's already looked down upon in the wargaming community, but it may happen. There's absolutely no right answer to this, but because of your recent ask for questions, this has been on my mind. Even writing this has sent me spiraling down the rabbit hole, thinking about all the possible answers to the question. So sorry for being so long-winded. Definitely feel free to paraphrase. <laughs> <and boil it laughs> down. Sorry, keep going. Anyway, uh, yeah, uh, I love the hobby, but my bank account not so much, says Tim. So um, first, I yeah, think I, I mean, think we if- need to introduce Tim to a man named James Ernest, <laughs> who thought the same thing as you, except. Yep about 25 to 30 years ago. He said, why should we sell games when we can just sell you the rules, essentially? You bring your own pieces to the games. And thus the company Cheap Ass was born. Yep. And he literally made probably 100 games or so. And and they, some of them were good, and some of them were like the very, very opposite of good. But the fact is, they never took off that well because people don't want to go to all that work. Yeah, it is. It is very as much as I've seen people invest in 3D printers. Um, it is sort of an exciting thing to play with. Uh, it is still a niche within the niche. Uh, uh, people who are willing to go through the technical expertise, and it does require a certain amount of technical know-how and fiddling to get these things to work correctly. Um, I I just don't see it being as viable a thing to to box or you know package a secondary edition of the game that doesn't actually contain all the minis because you're going to print them at home well there are some companies that have been selling stl files on kickstarter i've seen some very some kickstarters have done very well with this actually okay but most companies they want to sell as many games as they possibly can and the people who are willing to print out the first player marker and build their own upgrades they're out there i see them on board game geek and reddit all the time Mm -hmm. but they're a drop in the bucket compared to the people you want to sell the game to and i know that if i like just recently what was it oh i i got 
Street Fighter, the board, the miniatures game. Okay. Yep. And in this game, there's these dials and it's supposed to go to zero. And for some reason, the dial goes from one to 12. There's no zero on the dial. Oh. I was like, well, I looked online and lo and behold, in their FAQ, they have a PDF where you can print out the dials, the corrected ones onto sticker paper, cut those out and put them on the dials. And I thought, oh my word, I don't want to do that. I'm just going to make the dial go halfway between one and 12. (laughs) Because that's a lot of work. Right. I don't want to be the production company here. I'll do it sometimes to make my games better. I do it a lot actually, but I don't think it's as, what does the company get out of this? It's just goodwill a little bit, right? right? They don't get a whole lot out of doing this. They would rather make the miniatures and have you buy them from them. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I see it more as the the, the second topic that, that Tim brought up with the, the upgrades, a, a special first player marker or just sort of as a bonus. Um, and, and more with the Kickstarter campaign than with like a retail edition of the game. I, I wouldn't care if the box said includes a link to STL files to upgrade the first player marker. I'm like, uh, uh, whatever. Um, but as like a Kickstarter add-on, you know, we'll give you STL files for, you know, cool minis to to upgrade. Yeah, that's kind of neat. But if you're going to go through the trouble of designing and molding minis in the first place, why isn't that being added to the game in a retail edition? All right, our last question is from Dan, and he says his local area has a Facebook marketplace for selling used board games. But Dan finds that sellers overvalue their games. Often the asking price... Wait, have we already answered this one? It's a very similar question to one we had, uh, you know, a few weeks ago. Uh, Is it often the asking price is around $5 less than a new version of the game available on Amazon? I imagine their asking price is significantly less than what they had originally bought it for, but definitely not much less than it's available now. What do you think is the most appropriate way to price used games? What do you consider to be a good deal when considering purchasing a used game? Also, the conditions are listed at like new or very good. But they'll write it's in good condition, but the box says wear or damage. Is the seller obligated to include the condition of the game box or only the components of the game? Uh, well, that last part, absolutely. You, you should be talking about all of the components of the game, which also, includes you, the box. Your box could have a big scratch on it. I'll buy it. I don't care. Right. Well, see, the, but... The buyer needs to know that because I've heard the other side where a a small little ding or something that I find totally acceptable, as long as a box is still structurally sound, I'm fine if it has a little bit of a nick or a ding. That's what I just said. um, I'm I'm okay with that. But I have had or have heard stories of buyers of a game if I didn't disclose that little nick or scratch being very upset. Sure, I get that, but... I think pictures help a lot in this regard. That solves a lot of the problems. Sure. But, you know, I may call a game like new or in excellent condition, and I'm not, because I'm not considering that small little ding on the corner of the box to be anything detrimental to the structural stability of the box, but somebody might consider that, well, if it's not, if it's not mint, then I need to know everything that makes it not mint. All right, well, Dan says, what do you think is the most appropriate way to price used games? Uh, Normally, the way I do that, if I'm selling them, is I look them up online and look at the average of what they're going for right now and sell it slightly below that. And then when I'm buying a game, and what I think is a good deal, is I look up all the prices and buy the cheapest one. (laughs) I mean, I don't know what else to tell you. It's, It's a... It's a market out there, right? If if the games are selling for those prices, if if you're like that's a ridiculous price that you're asking for that, and it's cheaper on Amazon, then buy it on Amazon. Right. You know, I I don't see what the the problem is. If someone's if someone's selling a game and I look at that and go, that's too expensive, then I'll buy it somewhere else. Now the only time I can see that being annoying is if you say, I can't find them anywhere else. Well, then guess what? It's not being sold too inexpensively then. Yeah. Yeah, I guess, uh, you know, I, I think what Dan and, and the previous uh, writer from a couple weeks ago are, are complaining about is when prices are not, they haven't been adjusted for the market. Yeah, but, like, but so that what? That's, that's on that person, not not me. Right. Um, you know, I've seen other used copies go for $20. Why is this guy asking 35 Is is sort of the 
and, and can't you make them an offer then? Can't you just say, "Hey, I'll give you twenty bucks"? I imagine you could. Because for I, me, I, that would work. I'd be like, "Yeah, I want to get, I want to get this out of here." Right. I think my answer was that that person probably just hasn't adjusted for a market shift. Maybe they priced that game a year ago. Well, let me ask you this, Eric. When, when you then. go to a yard sale, yeah, what do you pay the price that's shown, or do you always ask for a lower price? I almost always will pay the price that's listed. I don't like to haggle. You don't like to haggle. See, unless unless it's you know egregiously wrong. But I'm not the kind of person who's going to be like I I'm going for a bargain no matter what. I want it to be less than what I'm seeing here. If if I don't think the market warrants it, then I might offer something else. But if it's you know if it's five dollars on on a game, and I I think yeah I'll, that's worth five bucks. I'll pay five dollars for it. Yeah, I'm kind of halfway in between. I'll be like, well, what if I buy two? <laughs> can I get you know this? You said these are ten dollars each. Can can I get two for fifteen? You 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 think you're going to find two games at a yard sale that you want? I I wasn't meaning games in particular. For me, it would okay. be something else, like I don't know books or something. I no, my dream of finding a good game at a yard sale. Well, it would be that would be like a miracle at this point. I would have to go to a yard sale and a find a game that I want and don't have, which is pretty <laughs> weird anyway. B, it's at a yard sale, and 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 one of the fascinating things about South Florida is yard sales happen all year round. Okay. So since they happen all year round, they're not nearly as good. Oh, yeah. They haven't been like saving up stuff. Right. <laughs> I mean, I, I always have a, the, the dream is like you stumble on a yard sale where it's it's somebody that inherited like a game collection. I don't need this binder don't... of black magic cards. Uh, do you, yeah, do I don't you want this? Them? These th This game for kids with the, what is this, Black Widow, Black Lotus card. I don't need this. <laughs> I think I think if that happened to me, I'd be like, um, "I'll give you five dollars." Uh, what if I buy two, <laughs> four each? No, but I mean, I think I might buy it, go sell it, and then come back and be like, "Dude, man, here's like two thousand dollars. I'm feeling bad." <laughs> I don't know what I would do in that situation. That would be a tough one. That's a good discussion topic. Like, if you went that... to a garage sale and you found something uber rare. Yeah, Would you they notify know them got. and and tell them? Because I was watching an episode of, uh, what's that show called where they they go into storage units? Antiques Roadhouse, or oh no, the storage units, uh, Storage Wars. Yeah, Storage Wars, and they found some some magic cards, and they took them to this convention, and the guys there were were. Like, God, yeah, this is worth, like, you know, several hundred dollars. They are not worth, they were worth thousands. They took these people on camera. Ooh. And, and I felt, that just feels dirty. So, I mean, if I find, like, a game at a, at a yard sale that's worth 50 bucks and they're selling it for 10, I don't feel bad about that, right? I mean, because they would have to go right. to work to sell it online and everything. But if I went and found something that was worth hundreds of dollars, where do you pause? This is, this is intriguing me because it's never happened to me. So, I don't, yeah. it's, it's all like, uh, I, I that, guess it's kind of like if someone comes up and dilemma. Pay, they they pay for something with a you know a, a quarter and you're like this quarter's from 1874 it's worth two hundred dollars <laughs> you know a double die Denver mint penny thanks Mister yeah that one all right well that's our questions folks let's get to the top ten list it's a dice tower top ten the dice tower's top ten list is brought to you by game nerds. At GameNERDZ.com. Okay, 20 years ago. We we just started doing it, I think, last year, right? Uh, no, we've been doing the 20-year look back for a few years. I think when it, when 96 was 20 years ago, we, we started doing it then. Don't worry, folks. We're done. We're not going to go 25, 30 years ago. Mostly no. because 2001 is scratching the bottom of the barrel. But 2001 is important for me because I got into modern gaming. I've been gaming my whole life. Yeah. You know, jumping from hobby to hobby. But in in modern gaming, I got into it in 2000, late 2001, early 2002, which means I've been doing this now for almost 20 years. And so I remember when these games were hot. Yes. I remember looking at these games and thinking, oh, these are the hotness. Yeah. Oh, I, I definitely, I entered the hobby at about that same time. And so some of these were... I just saw this game at the game store. I want to show it to you. This that's the sort of level we're at here with with some of these titles. 
That being said, I do not think this year has aged particularly well, mm. and there's very few games from this year. I don't know that there's any that's still like a hot game, but I I, I will mention there, there's two the two biggest games of tw- 2001 easily are Munchkin. <laughs> it's 20 years old now, yep. and Munchkin has made Steve Jackson a household name. It's made them a lot of money, and it's sold well. Makes a lot of people really happy. Sure. And Zombies, which uh, put Twilight Creations on the map. And they've made a lot of different horror games. But I think I just saw there was a Kickstarter for Zombies again. You know, it's like they even made a game for Zombies like Zombies the Last One, which wasn't even (laughs) close. You know, they still make more zombie stuff. But but these were very popular at this point in time. And they, they were different than a lot of games that were out. There was also, when I was making my list, Eric, I noticed... A lot of those big giant dexterity wooden games, hmm. like Fubi, yep, um, was out this year. Uh, there's one that's on my list actually that I'm going to mention. But there was um, there was a few of them, and I was like, oh yeah, I've seen these games. Uh, Board Game Geek, if you ever go to their convention, oh. they have a big area with all these crazy giant dexterity games that came out in Germany. It's a also, good place to to kill some time. It's a it's a lot of fun to try some of these out. Werewolves of Miller's Hollow was one of the first commercial versions of werewolves that came out, came out 20 years ago. Yep. And who stole Ed's pants? I don't actually have anything to say about that. I just think, I still think that name is funny. It is. It's a lovely game. I, on Board Game Geek, it says I owned that game at some point and I have no memory of playing it. <laughs> I have the memory of playing it, but uh, it, it's, it's a silly game about a thief and you're trying to figure out who the thief is or whatever, yes. but... Yeah, it's an interesting year, so I guess the best way to talk about it will to get into these picks, but I'm warning you folks ahead of time, you're going to hear some bad games mentioned. <laughs> um, uh, and, and you're not going to say who will mention them. I'm just yeah. saying. Okay. Number 10. We're going to kick things off with a mass market Hasbro card game called Split. This is actually the revised edition of Split. Uh, Split is, um, it's like a double deck of playing cards. Each card has half of a card on it. Uh, and you are trying to match up uh, the the different sides of the cards. And you can make weak matches where, say, it's uh, the king of clubs and a king of hearts or you can make a strong match, which is better, uh, which would be the king of clubs and the king of spades, halves, or an exact match, the, the perfect match, which is actually the two identical halves of the, of the card. Um, and you'll get varying points, and you upgrade other matches that are on the board. It's a cool little, uh, you know, take that card game where you're trying to protect the matches you've got and get the best matches trading cards around. Split, the revised edition, my number 10. I found this amusing briefly. My number 10 is Way Kick. Now, Way Kick is what the big wooden game I was talking about playing earlier. Way Kick has actually been replaced by the game that was talked about in our tale of horror, Clask. Hmm. But Way Kick was before Clask, and it was essentially air hockey, except you had your hands under the table. You were moving the, the things with like big magnets under the table and hitting the, the ball into the other person's uh, soccer goal. You know what? The fact of the matter is I like stuff like this. I like having these big games. You know, whether it's, you know, Fubi, which was the soccer one. You, you hit it with like a plastic stick and it bounced into your opponent's goal. Mm-hmm. I I enjoyed that. So that's why Way Kick made the list. And also because, uh, you know, I was trying to find 10 games to put on the list. <laughs> Number nine. My number nine is Risk 2210 AD. I think there were variants of Risk that came out before this, but this was, I think, the first big revolutionary new Risk uh, that took it into the future, added the moon, uh, really messed with the rules of Risk while keeping the core gameplay, but but really started uh, paving the way for stuff like Risk Legacy. Uh, in the next several years. Um, I I was so happy getting Risk 2210 for Christmas. Um, my, my wife gave it. It was one of our first board game purchases where she's like, here you go. This is a game I think you're really going to like. Um, Risk 2210 was a lot of fun, got a lot of playtime with my, my college buddies um, and uh, really enjoyed it. And it hasn't aged all that well, but I do still have the copy. So I think I think it will get played again. At some point. Number nine, 
Risk 2210. This was literally my number 11. I actually missed the game, and Eric uh, was on Eric's list. I was like, oh, I need to have that game. He so shoved risk- it off the list. I watched him do it, and there was no remorse. He said, bye-bye, Risk. Look, I liked it. Look, I played, of all the games on this list, I think I might have played Risk. Well, no, I haven't played it the most. But I played it a lot more than most of the games on this list because when it came out, I was like, this is Risk. This is different. Yeah. It's just that we, I still can't remember a friendly game of this. <laughs> I, I don't know. That, I guess 20 years ago, I was more tolerant of games that were, that caused that many arguments. Mm-hmm. I also, that. I was 20 years younger, so I argued more. Well, I was 24, Eric. <laughs> ah, much argumentative young man. All right, my number nine is uh, the game I stole from Eric's list, so we'll talk about it when we get to it. Number eight. And we'll talk about it right now. The game is Medina. Um, I, I didn't actually mention there hasn't been a lot of movement on this list uh, since the last time we did it, like five years ago. But Medina did did slip one slot. It was my number seven before. Um Medina is is a game where you're building buildings, uh, or actually collectively at first. You're putting down sections of buildings inside this town square, and at some point, someone's going to claim that building. Uh, and then once that's been claimed, it can't get any bigger. Uh, so it becomes this sort of game of chicken as you make buildings bigger and bigger and bigger, and then when's somebody going to claim it? Uh, is it still going to be there when it gets back to you? Um, but is there a better opportunity down the road to make a larger version of that same style of building? It's it's a cool game with very nice, chunky pieces. A newer Stronghold edition has come out in the last few years. Um, lovely game. Medina, my number eight. We should mention in passing here, folks, that when when I was looking at the last couple times we done, I've done this list. This is the fourth time I've done this list. And I did it five, ten, and like in 2005, like four years after the fact. And there's some games that have disappeared off the list, and I am convinced it's because the dates have been changed on Board Game Geek. It's entirely possible. This is hard. We were talking before the show. Researching these has gotten more and more difficult as we've gotten farther away. Like when we do the this year lists, we make all sorts of exceptions. Like the English version didn't come out until later this year or this. Right. You know, I can't this, remember that stuff 20 years ago. <laughs> no. So we have to go with whatever it says on Board Game Geek. And some of the things that were on our lists years ago are not even the, are not the correct dates anymore. Uh, if you're looking at the Board Game Geek listing. My number eight, I bought for two dollars at KB. Mm-hmm. Um, oh, I miss KB. But anyway, KB had some great sales when they were liquidating stuff. You could get some wonderful deals. Yeah, and this is still a game I have it at in the Dice Tower Library. If we're at a Dice Tower convention and we can find a quiet corner, I will play this game with you, and you'll be like, "This is better than I thought." And that's the eBay Electronic Talking Auction game. Mm-hmm. It doesn't sound like it's a good game, but it's actually quite fun. You have a bunch of cards that are worth money, different values of money, and you bid on various items in a time thing. It will be like, blue player, player, you know, bid, and you pick which thing you want to bid on. And you press a button, and the machine knows that you're the winning bidder for that. And at various random points, auctions end, just like eBay. Auctions end randomly at random mm-hmm. times. That's not true, but... <laughs> But I like this game a lot. I think it works really well. It's a, it was ahead of its time, and I wouldn't mind seeing something like this being done again, like a reworking of this. I found that it doesn't always work at conventions, though, because yeah, it's too noisy. It's so noisy. I'm like, what? What did he say? Did he say blue? Uh, whose turn is it? And you if need you go a, to the a, quiet room in order to be able to hear it, the people in the quiet room get mad at you. Yeah, it's kind of like a lose lose proposition. It's still in the Dice Tower Library, though eBay, the electronic talking auction game. Also, I should mention, I also really like Medina. It was my number nine. And um, uh, I just like the big chunky wooden blocks. And it definitely has that feeling of push your, not push your luck, but chicken. Chicken. Yeah, I like it's, that. A, it's a game of chicken for sure. Number seven. Uh, number seven this time was my number eight last time. It's uh, the Cosmos two-player game Flower Power. I've, I've talked about this one a lot and, and have harped on the fact that it was only available in German. I don't know why there was never an English edition of this. You oh, are collectively, uh, you're, you're building flower beds. Uh, it's sort of, you, you've got domino style tiles uh, and you're placing them on your side of the board. You can also place weeds on your opponent's side to mess with their structuring of flowers and trying to score Points for the the largest groupings possible. Flower Power, a lovely two-player game, and my number seven. 
Yeah, this is one I I I I make fun of Eric when he puts it on his list. I've never actually played it, so I don't know. I just I never I don't know that I ever will though. <laughs> That's the yeah. thing. I mean, it's an I, abstract about flowers. I mean. Well, I don't care about the about flowers thing. I mean, that's fine. It's just that my thinking is if it hasn't been reprinted in 20 years, Eric, it can't be that good of a game. I, I guess I, I get, I'm I going to have to come around to your way of thinking. All right. My number seven is higher than Eric's list because uh, he took the, the – the, 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 he, he picked the one I wanted. <laughs> number six. My number six did not make my list five years ago, and uh, I, I'm not – completely sure why it's actually come on and off the list it is the train game voldampf uh this is a martin wallace game that that sort of has some of the same uh ideas as age of steam or steam uh you're building roots using symbol cards to to build the roots around things and it's a pick up and deliver thing you're trying to complete roots complete uh orders uh, to get cubes from one place to another i liked the way that the system worked and uh and so Remembering back 20 years quite fondly, Voldomp takes the number six slot. Yeah, oddly enough, I never played this one. Um, but it's, again, every time I talk to people about it, they're like, well, it was the precursor to Age of Steam. And I'm like, well, I, I'd rather play that game then. Yeah. You know, why should I go yeah. play the, the earlier version? Sure. My number six is Warlord Saga of the Storm. This is a collectible card game, which is very sadly out of print. But probably for good reason. It, if, if it does come back, it needs a reworking. But it was essentially a Dungeons & Dragons style collectible card game. You rolled 20-sided dice to attack people. And you would be building like a pyramid of cards. The, you could have a whole bunch of cheap people in front of you, but you needed like two level ones to put a level two out. So if I wanted to put a level four out, I had to build like a pyramid of creatures. And then they would move to the front and you had this warlord. And if you killed your opponent's warlord, you won. Lots of special abilities, but definitely a product of, of its time. But it's one I've always found to be fun, and it's one of the, it's one of I think three collectible card games I still own some cards for. That's Warlord Saga of the Storm. Number five. My number five is a Queen Games title, another one available only in Germany, called Die Magier von Pangea, the Mages of Pangea. Uh, you're sliding pieces of this board around, trying to claim magical amulets and do so before your opponents. It's also got alternate victory conditions. You can either get five of those amulets, or you can get four and a whole bunch of money, and or three and a whole, whole bunch of money. Uh, so there's ways to possibly win and sneak a victory away from somebody who has the lead at one point. I, I just like how unique it is. Dimagier von Pangea, number five. I'm not sure that we've ever done an episode of this show where Eric has talked about it and I didn't give him grief. <laughs> it's true because you think it's like those those little sliding puzzles that you get as party favors. Yeah, except that it has this big complicated game around it. I don't know. Meh. My number five is an exciting, wonderful game called Dragon's Gold, which has been reprinted at least twice in which you are fighting dragons, which is a very minor point, and then splitting the treasure, which is the major point. Mm -hmm. You have uh, a set time limit. You have to split the treasure. You can't make future promises. Use past stuff. It has to be right here and now. Me, Eric, and Suzanne have to split seven discs. So annoying. Yep. How do we do it? We all have to agree or no one gets anything. I love it, but it is kind of a mean game, and I think Eric doesn't like it. Uh, the only time I ever played this was with you, Tom, and you yelled a lot. Well, that doesn't actually narrow down what the game was, but <laughs> fine. <laughs> I just didn't like the yelling. Number four. My number four was Tom's number seven, and that is the Reiner Knizia betting classic winner's circle. Uh, you, you Which was place... originally called Royal Turf, by the way. That is that is very true. Uh, you, you place bids uh wagers on various horses that have different movement uh criteria some will move fairly evenly around the board based on die rolls some will move a whole lot on one or two symbols but not very much on the other symbols and so you're you're sort of taking the risk that maybe the symbols land for them maybe they won't um and, and uh you've got all these secret bids and then you run a race and then see who came in first, second, and third, who makes the most money. Uh, it's a lovely game. Winner's Circle, number four. It really is fun. It's it's a game that I kind of waffled on 
because when I played it, I thought this is pretty neat. Then I played other horse racing games that I liked better. Mm. But the simplicity of this one and the ease it is, it makes it a wonderful welcoming game to get to the table. Yeah. My number four is Starship Catan. Now, Starfarers of Catan was the space version of Settlers of Catan. And then Starship Catan was the space version of the two-player Settlers of Catan. Yes. But Starship Catan was a dramatically different game. It had you collecting resources in your spaceships, building up a spaceship, and then diving through piles, searching through piles to find resources and to find the right planets. It had a little bit of a memory aspect because you'd remember which planets were in which pile. I really like this game. I think it's aged really well. They remade it, I don't know, about six years ago with a sea captain vibe to it and made it more than two players, and it just wasn't as good. It still was a decent game, but not as good. The two-player version of this has held up well, and now that Cosmos you know, is remaking some of this stuff, remake this one! I guess mate, I guess Cosmos doesn't have it anymore. It would probably, have to be Catan Studios. Catan Studios. Yeah. Remake this wonderful game! Uh, I've only Catan. played this a couple times, and in fact, this did make my list... Uh, five years ago. It, it knocked Voldomf off the list, but I haven't played it since then. Uh, it's hard to find, and uh, I, I think I have to go to Jeff Engelstein's house to play it. That's the only time I've been able to well, do so. Most of the, like, I, like I said, well, we'll talk about this again. Most of these games are hard to find. Uh, that's very true. Uh, not, not my next one, um, or actually the next two. Uh, but... Um, this one, it I just haven't had a chance to play it, and it's faded in my memory. I remember really enjoying it when I, I did get a chance to play it. Um, but that's why it's off my list this time. Number three. Number three has slipped down one position. It was number two five years ago. That's Transamerica. Uh, the simplest of the train games. You're, you're just connecting routes. Uh, this one's been a huge hit with my family. Um, it, it, it is less complicated than Ticket to Ride, which many consider to be uh, the ultimate gateway uh, train game. This one's even more gateway. Uh, this one's even more simple. Um, I, I just love how, how simple it is, how quick it is to learn, and how it iterates multiple times. You play around, and then you do it again, and it's almost the same thing. Um, Transamerica, lovely family favorite. Number three. This game has two good things going for it. Um, one... It's one of the reasons Eric's on the show today. Ha ha! Because he did a 72 second review of the mini expansion for it. Vexation. Um, yes. Uh, and I've softened on this one. I didn't care for it as much when it came out because I was kind of comparing it to Ticket to Ride, which came out like, three years later. So I'm not sure why. Yeah. I, I think I just played them close to the same time. It's a different style game. I still don't think I love it. I like if you put vexation in, it's a tiny little expansion that adds just it's not take that, but gives you a little bit more control, I feel. Mm-hmm. I think that makes the game a better game. But um yeah, I, I enjoy this more. And you know, it's funny because this game was the hotness. It, it is was not even point. it's not even close to that now. I don't know what happened. Yeah. But it like they just reprinted it a couple of years ago, I think only in Germany, where they put Trans America and Trans Europa in the same box. Okay. And yeah, that that came and went, and no one even noticed. Well, yeah. Tw- Twenty years ago, though, it was it was there. Oh, that was your thing. I was I got talked yeah. I got caught talking about your game, and it's I should be talking about my game, you which should. is Vabank. Now, if you played Vabank there, and you're listening to this show. There's about a 75% chance that it was with me at a convention. <laughs> because this is one of my go-to games. I'm like, oh, what should I play? Oh, Vabank! Let's bring it out. Come on, everybody. Let's play it. This game was on Kickstarter recently and uh, did not succeed, unfortunately. But oh. I wouldn't uh, notice I'm not too sad about that. Uh, who knows why? But Vabank is a silly push-your-luck. Not push-your-luck, but bluff. Bluff other players. To get money. You can watch it on the Dice Tower YouTube channel. We played it a few times live. It's silly as all get out. I am clearly the person in the Dice Tower who likes it the most. <laughs> all right. It's it's just a game that I love. I understand why people don't like it, but I just love this idea of just outguessing everybody else. So that's my number three, Vabank. Number two. 
My number two is going to show up on Tom's list, and I think I know the rules as to why. My number two is part of the Gipf series, and this is Devon. And this is where I'm feeling super guilty here. Because I remember way back in 2002, Games Magazine did their games of the year, their top 100 games of the year. Yeah. And their number one was Devon. And I was like, this person doesn't know what they're talking about. (laughs) A phrase many of you who are listening have repeatedly said about me now, I'm sure. (laughs) And I still think Yinch is the best of this series. And I still think there was many good games that came out in 2001. But Devon has stood the test of time. It is a really, really good two-player game. You have It's white pieces versus black pieces. You move them. The number of pieces that are on a stack, you land on top of other stacks. But if your stack ever gets separated from three red pieces on the board, they die. Yeah. It's such a fascinating, really well done game. I don't know. It just really does well for me. Devon. Uh, I I owned and enjoyed Devon. I'm wondering if this didn't show up on my radar because of of the time thing on, on Board Game Geek. This might have had a different date on it when I checked. It's possible, Eric. I'm, I'm I'm losing track. It is possible. Devon is a great game. In fact, I played it uh, at the last Gen Con we got to go to, which uh, would have been 2019. I played it with Crystal uh, and, and introduced it to her, and she really enjoyed it as well. She hadn't played many of the Zertz series games, and I knew Devon said, let's, let's play this one. Well, interestingly uh, enough, a very similar thing happened. I played it at the last con I went to, which was Dice Tower West. There was someone up early in the morning. I was like... Hey, I bet you've never played this, and I was correct. There you go. And finally, number one. All right. uh, My number one from five years ago is still my number one when I look back at 2001. It was at one point my number one game, uh, the one that I I enjoyed the most, and that is Ent Decker, Exploring New Horizons. You, You are building a collective map of islands, sending a ship out from various sides of the board, uh, and paying, you sort of gamble money, to pull a certain number of tiles and hopefully create a map that you can then put your little settlers down on and uh, and sort of claim. And then you've got an area control situation as you complete the islands uh, and score points. Um, I, I love the way it looks when you're all done. You've created this neat little archipelago and uh, and you've been fighting for points the whole time. Ent Decker, Exploring New Horizons, is my number one from 2001. This is a game I enjoyed um, a little bit and I think it's completely completely out of date 20 years later Hmm. but it's eric's number one so what do i know well my number one is eric's number two and that's zendo now interestingly enough if we had recorded this i think four years ago and you we had talked about it eric said this is back in print it wasn't then right in fact the only way to get zendo was to buy some ice house pieces from looney labs aren't even called ice house pieces anymore Oh, they're not? What are they called? Yeah, they're called Looney Pyramids now. Maybe because they always Because nobody were. knows what Ice House is. Yeah, so if you don't know what we're talking about, there are a bunch of clear pyramids of three different sizes, of, and they made a set of, I think, I don't know, like 20 different colors you could buy, but they made tons of games. Andrew Looney churns out games faster than anyone else. <laughs> he and James Ernest were like kings in 2001 of the cheap games. There was a big push for that. Yeah. Um. I don't know where that push is today because right now the, apparently the goal is to spend as much money on a single game as you possibly can. <laughs> uh, yeah. Ah, how things have changed in 20 years. I, I, I think we're going to have a rebound soon. I know we have the wallet size games. But anyway, Zendo is a game in which people have been playing this game for a long time, like online or party games. Like, I have a Weeble, and you have to guess what the, what the rule is to be a Weeble. Sally is a Weeble. Bobby is a weeble. Susan's not a weeble. And you're like, oh, okay. <laughs> okay you know, yeah. So eventually you find out that a weeble meant they have double letters in their names. Uh-huh. You know, So that's what Zendo is. You put a bunch of these pyramids. Well, now the new version has different shapes, not just pyramids. Pyramids and cylinders and, and – uh, no, pyramids, wedges and uh, a hexagonal um, – so anyway – Man, my, my mind just went back. Hexagonal Pyramids, prisms. wedges, and blocks, right? 
Yeah, so you put them in front of you, and you have to figure out what the rule is. Maybe the rule is there are no yellow pieces in your thing. There is only three pieces, and no more, no less. Whatever the right. rule is, and it you make these rules pretty simple rules, but it's really tricky, and you are slowly trying to figure it out. The first person to figure out the rule is the winner. I love this game. This is also one I teach to people at conventions because most people haven't played it. But it's a very, very thinky game. Sure. And can get very complex. This was my number two. Uh, and it's moved up a little bit, partially because my son got interested in the, when the new uh, new printing came out, the new version. He tried it out and really enjoyed it. And it was on his wish list for, for a while. It was uh, He had a ninja competition that didn't go very well. And I sort of cheered him up by taking him to a game store and getting Zendo. And then he was happy. Um it, it can get very complex. And one of the things that the new edition does uh, is it gives you some more suggested rules on cards. Um, because back when you could make whatever rule you wanted for the game, you could come up with some needlessly complicated ones that you think make a lot of sense in your head, but are virtually impossible to suss out based on the rules of the game. And you could be there for hours trying to figure out this rule. Um so I do appreciate the newer edition giving you a little bit more guidance. It's sort of like making the Robo Rally boards that are too big. It was possible to go off the rails with Zendo. Right. And Zendo, yeah, again, if you play this game, I swear, play it on easy level first. Yeah. And yeah. you will probably be content with that for a while. <laughs> All right, let's take a look at the People's Choice. Number 20. Won the Spiel des Jahres. It's one of the worst winners of the Spiel des Jahres, in my opinion, and that's Villa Paletti. This is a, if you're wondering, like, I never heard of that one. Yeah, everyone else was pretty mad that this beat Puerto Rico. <laughs> although, although at the time, it makes sense. You know, it's a much lighter game than Puerto Rico. It's a dexterity game where you pull out pillars of a tower with these little hooks hmm. and try not to make it fall over. It's It's okay. Number 19, Dracone. Now, this would probably be higher. There's like four editions of the game now. They spread out where you go into a dungeon and try to steal the dragon's treasure. Number 18 is Carcassonne the River. This is an expansion. <laughs> yeah, although it comes in, there, there are certainly editions of Kark that, that come with the river. It's, it's now included in the basic box. I was going to say, I think... I think you would be hard-pressed to find a copy that doesn't have the river at this point. Right. 17 is a game I considered called Capital. This is from Alan Moon. Okay. And it's about building buildings in ancient Rome. It's a little, like, again, this is, again, a product of its time. I would not even look at the game now. I would think it was too boring. But at the time, I was like, building buildings in an ancient city? This sounds amazing. 16 is, I think, the only... James Ernest game to make this list as we were talking about those earlier and that's unexploded cow yeah and I believe you were using cows to find landmines to then provide you with hamburger that's <laughs> pretty close to the theme of the game <laughs> okay 15 is Starship Catan and again like I said not a lot of people have heard of it um, or played it 14 is Risk 2210 13 Medina 12 Dragon's Gold 11, Werewolves of Builder's Hollow. 10, Mystery Rummy, Jekyll and Hyde. Okay. I like this one okay. I, I, I don't know that it's my favorite. My favorite is the, the, the Al Capone, but I also like the first one. Jekyll and Hyde, I think, is the third one. Uh, the I think that's right. Number nine is Zombies. Number eight is Genoa, or back in 2001, it was called The Traitors of Genoa. Oh. This one is too, there's too much going on in this game. You can trade anything for anything, almost, but it doesn't, you don't really know the values of stuff very well. This game has not aged well for me. I liked it when I played it. Now I'm sitting there like, oh, this game's such a pain to teach. But for a while, this was considered a big classic. Yeah, but it was one of the few Dutch auction games that existed and had some cool components. Yeah, it did. Well, for the for 2001. Sure. Number seven is Evo, which was a game about evolving your dinosaurs so they would survive whatever might happen next. Right. You could give them 
uh, heat resistance, cold resistance, more feet so they move faster in the board, even an umbrella. Um, don't ask, it's in the game. It's <laughs> yep. good, but again, it feels like it's missing something again 20 years later, but I, I did enjoy it at the time. Yep. Number six, San Marco. This was the quintessential I split, you choose game. Yeah, it's a good one. Isn't this also Alan Moon? Or maybe it's Aaron Wise, but I don't remember. Um, but San Marco, again, this is a fine game that I haven't played for probably 18 years. So hmm. five is Zendo, four, Transamerica, three, Devon, two, Winter Circle, and guess what? Number one is Munchkin. Oh, Y'all yeah. picked Munchkin, so I will accept that choice. As okay. the people's choice. Well, I mean, I, I think Munchkin was the entry point for a lot of people, and especially at this at this time period, Munchkin was was one of the you know chief novel brand new games. It's like, oh, check out this game! It's hilarious. Let's play it. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I can't. I I don't get me wrong. I hate Munchkin. All right, but I that's a personal thing. I I think that people who like playing it. That's fantastic. You should enjoy it. And and it's brought, like you said, so many people in the hobby. I like the Munchkin theme, actually. I like Munchkin Smash Up and Munchkin Dungeon, which Simon C- mm-hmm. reprinted last year. I like that. So it's still weird for me to think that these things are 20 years ago. Oh, boy. <laughs> but they do feel like they were 20 years ago at this point. You, definitely, folks, at this point, you can see that our hobby has definitely changed so much. It's changed more in the past 20 years than it changed the entire history before that. Hmm. That might be hyperbole. That, yeah, I don't know. I'm not, I'm not convinced. <laughs> I don't know. Let me think about that. Okay. Uh, maybe, I don't know. There's Magic the Gathering. I got to be careful. <laughs> so, anyhow... There we go, folks. That's it for years. But you know what? We have the alphabet to finish up. We do, and we're, Z, we're almost there. Z. I should have brought Z Garcia on a guess for that, and he would have been like, "Don't, don't associate me with these games." <laughs> I believe, I believe we will have a guest for our top ten Z games. That's right. We'll we're come back. To. Come back, folks, and we'll talk about them then. Um, but that's it for this episode. Thanks for listening. Until next time, I'm Tom Vassell. I'm Eric Summer. And you've been listening to The Dice Tower. Thanks for listening. Promotional consideration has been provided by game publishers in the form of review copies of games. This episode, number 706, was recorded on April 15th, 2021. Mandy and Suzanne join you next week, and in two weeks, Mandy joins us for a top 10 list of games that start with Z. Support for this podcast comes from listeners like you. Thank you for spreading the word. And speaking of support, the Jack Vassell Memorial Fund is dedicated to providing support to members of the board gaming community in their hour of need. Find out more about the fund's mission and how you can help at jackvassell.org. The Dice Tower is produced by Tom, Mandy, Suzanne, and Eric, with production assistance from Roy Canaday, Mike Delisio, Chris Yee, and Rob Seary. Our theme was composed by Timothy Pinkham. Yeast detection services provided by Bread Rising and hosting is provided by Game Nerds, your all-in-one solution for all your nerdy needs at GameNerdsWithAZ.com. We love feedback. Visit the Dice Tower Guild at BoardGameGeek.com, email us at Tom at Dicetower.com or Eric at Dicetower.com, or follow us on Facebook. And of course, you can find more from the Dice Tower Network, including Board with Video Games, Meeple Overboard, Solosaurus, Sporadically Board, Flip Flory's Super Saturday Board Game Serial, Board Game Design Lab, and Dice Tower Now at Dicetowernetwork.com. Until next time, from all the gang at the Dice Tower, have fun gaming. I'm sorry, Tom. I can't do that. Uh, Eric, open the game box. What are you doing, Tom? I'm throwing these insert away I don't need. I can't let you do that, Tom. Ah!